So, hi everyone. Welcome to this um, this week's workshop on buddy plants. Um, we're so happy you're here and you can make it. Um, so, I am Casey Hummeldorf. I am the Girl Scout who's been um, so luckily running these workshops with Manassas Park City Library and with the um, Prince William Master Gardeners. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, Valerie, if you would care to introduce yourself and about the seed box that we've installed. Sure. Hi, guys. My name is Valerie. I work here at the Manassas Park City Library. Um, we were really excited when uh, Casey came to us with her idea to start the gardening workshop series and to bring a uh, seed exchange box to the library, which is located um, on the outside of the library. We're located in Looms Park. Um, so it's a leave a seed, take a seed kind of deal um, with lots of great information in there as well. Um, but yeah, no, we're real excited for Casey to be hosting these uh, workshops. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to her. Okay, thank you, Valerie. So overview of the day, uh, we did our introductions um, with this being a, a me presenting Thing, instead of having a master gardener present today, we're trying to aim for 40-ish minutes. It might go a bit under, might go a bit over. Um, but yeah, we'll still have our 10-minute Q&A slash comments at the end. Um, rules and discretions, please keep muted during the presentation and put your questions and comments in the chat. I, I love seeing the chat just go off and put their own input, put their own things about um, the, the presentation that's going on, um, no spamming the chat, although I know that, um, this might be common knowledge, I have worked with low kids before during Zoom presentations, and I just keep it as a ground rule every single time. Um, these sessions will be recorded and uploaded into the Manassas Park City Library YouTube channel. So if you don't feel comfortable with being recorded, you are free to leave. We're so happy that you showed up in the first place. I am very grateful for it. Valerie is very grateful for it. Um, the Zoom will be up on the library's YouTube page a couple of days after the session. Um, and yeah. So th this week's presentation is about buddy plants. Um, so I'm going to first start off with um, what the buddies are and then what the slightly, I don't want to say, say plant enemies are, but plants that don't work so well together. So first things first, pollinated buddies. Although flowers are the most commonly thought of type of pollinated buddies, herbs work amazing too. So like lemon balm, parsley, basil, even chamomile, lavender, and mint. Like those all work well. Those all will attract um, the pollinators you need, like bees, butterflies. Um, and yeah. So insect repellent buddies. Now, I will admit a tad bit contradictory, but we don't want specific insects in our gardens. So we don't want insects that'll eat like our tomatoes or eat our peas or eat stuff that eat stuff from our harvest that we want to eat. So stuff like basil. Basil is a great pollinator buddy, but it also gets rid of houseflies and mosquitoes, which I find very interesting. We we have a ton of houseflies, we have a ton of mosquitoes over in our area. So just having that around and having that knowledge is amazing. Uh, dill. Dill attracts spider mites, squash bugs, aphids, and tomato hornworm. Um, so don't, don't put dill near tomato plants just because of the tomato hornworm, but you want to keep dill somewhere nearby just so that those bugs 
go towards the dough instead of what their usual um what their usual like plants are garlic surprisingly repels um carrot flies repels cabbage worms slugs aphids um and then uh chives like deter japanese beetles that's another big thing in my area just if if you can we try us in the girl scouts we try to make do with eco-friendly materials so if you use chives instead of a japanese beetle trap like that that's a great way to like not harm the environment or anything um it also deters carrot flies aphids mites and surprisingly rabbits so if you have a rabbit problem chives are the way to go um another big thing is that some flowers can also um repel bugs from your garden so Marigolds and lavenders are the big common ones that I saw while researching all this. Mar marigolds, um, the typical ones that you see are like repel nephetoids, but those should be planted at least a year beforehand, just so that the scent takes effect. Um, it also deters be bean beetles, although I sh I didn't I couldn't find out if you could if you need to plant them one year beforehand. Although it is better to be safe than sorry and plant these all in advance. Um, pot marigolds surprisingly a different type of marigold, and it deters different types of bugs. Pot marigolds um, deter asparagus beetles, also tomato hornworms. A surprising amount of these plants deter tomato hornworm. Um, lavender surprisingly deters ticks. Now, I live near a forest. Ticks are a big problem, and just having lavender around just helps a lot. And it is thought to repel mice and moths. They're still doing research on that, although just it, it might deter mice and moths moths so if you do have a problem like might might as well check check it out Ex try to experiment try to see if it works um yeah and the flowers just smell very good i personally love the lavender scent um so extremely friendly plants i found this whole chart on farmer's almanac farmer's almanac has been a huge help during my research in all this um and they have really great things. So what I found to be is tomatoes are the most friendly. Um, corn, radishes, carrots, cucumbers are also very, very friendly. Um, again, this whole chart is on the Farmer's Almanac and you, there's a ton of friendly plants to one another. Um, yeah. And now we're, now we're getting onto more of the of the questionable um, plants. Fennel, um, fennel is sort of an insect magnet. This could be seen as both a good or a bad thing, depending on the insects you want. So if you if you want like ladybugs, honeybees. These are great. These can go with the herbs. These can go with the flowers. Although they also can attract hoverflies, parasitic wasps, and, te and technid flies. Now, these might not be so helpful for your garden. So it's kind of a risk to grow fennel. Um, fennel also prohibits the growth of bean bushes, tomatoes, and a lot more plants. Um, just just because um it it attracts so many problems um it it is suggested by um farmers to plant fennel away from a garden than to plant than to plant it with the garden just because it attracts so much problems but yeah 
Now, tomatoes. I I want to specify tomato stuff just because tomatoes are such a big crop and it's it's easy to grow tomatoes, although they come with their own um their own risks and challenges. So you really want to, when you're planting tomatoes, you really want to avoid putting them anywhere near the cabbage family. Be that broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce. It just stunts the growth of the tomatoes. Um, corn. Now, cor you might have heard of corn earworm. Corn earworm and tomato fruit worm are very similar. Um, they they both come from the same family, so they both eat those two foods. Um, and just it it'll attract both of them. Um, you also want to avoid eggplants, peppers, and potatoes. Um, just growing them in the area that you just grew eggplants or peppers or potatoes, it makes them more susceptible to blight, which I have put here on the bottom right-hand corner. That's what a blighted tomato like looks like. Now, there's both early blight and late stage blight. Um, just even if you don't get early blight from planting where eggplants, peppers, and potatoes are, you can still get those late stages, which I, I wouldn't recommend taking the risk. Um, and then on, on your bottom um, left-hand corner is just a photo of what corn earworm or tomato fruit worm looks like if you ever see it in your garden. Potatoes, another big thing I saw while researching. Potatoes are, potatoes are like fennel. Potatoes are both equal part beneficial and unhelpful and incomparable. Um, raspberries, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, pumpkin, they can all develop blight near potatoes. And if, and again, like I said with tomatoes, if it's grown like where potatoes were first grown, it can cause early or late stage blight. Um, carrots, asparagus, funnel, turnips, onions, even sunflowers, those can all stunt um, the growth of potatoes. Car carrots being grown in ground with potatoes and then sunflowers, they, sunflowers can grow up to six feet tall, blocking the sun from, from the potatoes from getting all the nutrients they need. Um, yeah, so there, there's charts like this all, like, in most garden stores I've been to. These ones I found at Maryfield Garden Center. They, they will, t they will give you a list of pollinators, of plants that go well together, and what plants to avoid. Although they won't give you, they won't give you the reason why they should be avoided which I find pretty, pretty inconvenient. I, it just requires you to go into a bit more research. Um, so as, as you can see, like with the tomato plant, like you need to avoid fennel, um, you need to avoid corn. It doesn't, it doesn't state why, so that's why I encourage you to go into more research as to like why these should be avoided. What are the effects if I don't avoid them? Um, with with the attracting pollen, sorry guys, can you see me? We can hear you. We can hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, a, com a common joke for all these workshops is something has to go wrong. <laughs> so, um, 
so yeah, just just there's a ton of flowers that um, bring bring pollinators, which is kind of expected with the flowers. Um, there, there's also a ton of herbs that I found interesting with all this. Um, herbs can bring a lot of pollinators to your area. And yeah, it is. So we, we are towards the end of the presentation. I did not expect it to be this short. I am sorry about that, guys. Um, but I did want to touch on a few things that we're doing at the library. Um, we just, we have like set everything up to have a seed box restock. So if you've went over and checked the seed box recently, it has been very, um, empty, very bare. I love seeing it, just how much the community has like enjoyed the box and so we're going to have that restock soon we're also going to be having the recyclable container starter kits restocked um again those have three toilet paper rolls three miniature milk cartons 11 ounces of dirt that can make roughly a gallon um instructions on how to make recyclable pots and flyers for our future classes um our next class is going to be on the 22nd, and we're going to talk more about what kind of pests you can, um, what kind of pests you can find in your garden, and what are some eco-friendly ways um, to to deal with those pests. Um, these recyclable containers are first come, first serve. They're also going to be open to the public, so. So yeah, just first come, first serve. We'll see how many we can, we'll see if we can do a restock again later on. But yeah, again, I didn't expect the presentation to go that short. Um, if you have any questions or comments, let me know. Um, Valerie, if you wanna add anything on, if anyone wants me to touch back on any of the slides, Uh, yeah. Cassandra, this has been really great to see you do this presentation. It's the first time I've been to one of these. I am a mess because I've been working in the yard all day, so I'm going to leave my camera off. Um, <laughs> I also love the Farmer's Almanac site as a pretty new-ish gardener. I guess it's the second or third year at this particular location where I live now. Um, so I've been really relying on the Master Gardeners and the Farmer's Almanac to learn from. It's really exciting to see this program through the Manassas Park Library. So well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. It, it has been just as a daughter of gardeners and people who have gardened for a long time, it it's been amazing what the library has helped me with, what the master gardeners have helped me with. Well, um, gardeners, gardeners are such a communal bunch, you know, like we learn from each other. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. that, that kind of feeling of this. Yeah, and I, I'm, I did not expect um, this presentation to be like as short as it was. Um, I I highly encourage you to look at the Manassas Park City Library YouTube page. They have um, we've done amazing presentations like with the Manassas with the Prince William Master Gardeners, um, and I've I've really loved doing this. I've really loved seeing all the community support around this and how much people have loved it. Well, I really like that this particular topic really spoke to my heart because I, I like to be as organic as possible in the garden and, and using plants to benefit each other is I think a really smart way of doing it. Marigolds are magic in the garden. Yeah. 
Oh, I will pass one tip on for those of us who are here. Um, last year, I had some deer come into my backyard and bump over all my tomato plants, which was not good. So I looked up online how to deal with that. And I didn't like all of the chemicals and whatever that they said to put out. And so I went and got some steaks and I put like garden steaks, like wooden steaks. And I got like a big jumbo pack of soap and I zip tied it to the stakes and the, the deer completely left my garden alone the rest of the year. So that's a little hot tip. I can't oh, put a fence wow. up on that, my garden, but that's a little hot tip for everybody. That's great. I, I haven't heard of that one before. So I might have to use that one. I chose Irish spring, which is extremely annoying smelling, so. <laughs> it definitely is. And Casey, uh, Nicole had uh, mentioned in the chat that she'd previously gone for like the aesthetic over the functionality of planting her plants. So thanks for letting us know that we need to put a little bit more thought into like where we plant our things. Um, yes, but I, you I would say, I would say like if you're going for potted plants, like you can probably sacrifice um, aesthetic more, but be be careful how you set up potted plants. Um, but definitely like for gardens, if you want to like have an edible garden, definitely think more about like how you want to set it up, what plants you want to have where, and don't put funnel in your garden. <laughs> unless you are trying to uh, attract pollinators. And I think that brought up a really good point, Casey. If you could go back to the um, pollinator buddy slide. Um, I've previously worked in um, native butterfly gardens before. And um, there are a lot of plants that um, are great at attracting pollinators. But if there's maybe a specific type of pollinator you're trying to attract, um, such as like maybe a specific type of butterfly, for example, it's good to know that all of those types of insects have plants that they favor. So if you're looking for a specific type of pollinator in your yard, um, finding out what sort of plants they're attracted to, because all pollinators are gonna have specific host plants that they look for. So that's another good way to um, bring pollinators into your yard. And likewise, if you find that one of your plants are is just being decimated by insects, um, knowing that pollinators have a specific host plant, um, you can use that to identify what is eating your plants. That way you can better protect them and prevent against insect infestation if that's not something you're looking for. But I think partnering the plants, uh, using buddy plants is a really great way to um, maximize your garden. And Casey, would you say that um, buddy plants would be easier or more functional if you did them in containers or if you planted them in the ground? Uh, it... I would say it really depends on, so you're just talking buddy plants in general, or are you talking pollinators? A buddy plants in general. Do you think it would be, it's better to do it in the ground or in containers? I feel like it would be easier in containers. I, I feel like it would be easier in containers, although if you want effectiveness, um, it's better to do it in the soil just that way um like any nutrients that the two plants share like you have both the nutrients in that in that soil um and just it for pollinated plants i i would definitely say like keep keep them in the ground in the garden Although, if you want, like, insect plants, if you want to get rid of certain insects, I would say 
um, do those in pots. Just that way it's easier to move the, um, so like the one we were talking about with tomatoes, um, the corn earworm, tomato fruit worm, you, I would say put those in pots just so that way it's easier to like move the, move the pests away from where they would normally eat. Okay. And we did a, um, a workshop previously for anybody new joining us on container gardening. So those are all on our uh, YouTube channel or our website if you wanted to um, check those out as well. They go along with the um, container gardening starter kits that we have here at the library. So that's just uh, a little plug for that. Pam? Yeah, go ahead. Ask, yeah. ask away. <laughs> um, but I think that was the only question I had with how it how it relates to um, container gardening. And what was um, you had mentioned about the soil and the different nutrients in the soil? Where can um, they go to learn more about that for gardening? So I. I know this might be a bad thing to say, depending on who you ask, but Google is your best friend in these in these instances. Um, I would also say look into the farmer's almanac. Um, and again, if if you want a more professional opinion and you don't trust the almanac, um, you can email your questions to the Master Gardener Horticultural Help Desk. Um, I have the email put up right there. So just, it, it really depends on what you're looking for, for like nutrients. So if your soil doesn't have enough nitrogen, and again, you would need to get your soil tested, um, through the Master Gardener, through the Master Gardener Association, um, I had mentioned the prices in a couple videos. I don't have the exact prices off the top off the top of my off the top of my head right now. Um, but yeah, it it really depends on what what plants need what what your what your soil needs. Uh, yeah. I'll send them pictures asking what's this. Yeah, so my, my hydrangeas apparently had some kind of frost burn early in the season this year. And I sent a picture to them because I have a whole lot of hydrangeas. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? They were like, yeah, don't worry about it. It's not that bad. It'll be better. And it, they have, they've overcome it and it's they're lovely now. So <laughs> yeah. And like the experience I've had with the Master Gardeners, they've always been helpful. They've always been really quick to respond, really nice. So I I highly recommend um, emailing them just to just if you have any questions at all, really. Uh, Great. Well, thank you so much, Casey. Were there any other uh, questions that anybody had or insight into the, today's presentation? You can um, pop it in the chat. Um, but if not, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording for today's video. You guys are welcome to stay and hang out in chat if you'd like, or um, if you need to head out, that's all right as well. Or if you've got more gardening to get back to, that's also <laughs> on today's agenda for, uh, for me as well when, when we leave uh, the library here today. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for today's video, Casey. Yeah, thank, thank you all so much for coming. Um, again, we will be getting the seed box restocked soon, and, and we will be um, having more of those starter kits in the um, library 
soon. So look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, 